Okay, uh, we're going to start with our first talk for the, today, uh, in which Marko Kajic is going to talk about uh, building the school 2.0. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to say good morning first because I, I think that a lot of you just woke up. Um, I know I have. <laughs> so this, this talk is going to be a, a lengthy one, and I apologize in advance for a lot of these abstract notions that um, this talk is going to present. Um, the talk itself is a product of five years' work, um, and it's trying to question a lot of things that the current educational system is you know, imposing on us in a sense. So I'm going to try to um, communicate that in, in the best way possible so you can, you can see what um, School 2.0 should be. Uh, so as the slide says, building the School 2.0 is, uh, is the topic for today. Before we start, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I'm developing Zonfit, which is a, an architect of a School 2.0. I work on free education, and I build free schools. Uh, one of these free schools is, is here in Serbia. Uh, I have a few um, students here from, from that free school. Um, I also, in my spare time, if you can call it that way, I uh, advise venture capital funds and startups. I try to promote free culture and um, do a lot of work with, uh, with free software. And um, I invest in moonshots and, and deeply transformative projects that have exponential um, potential for exponential growth, right? Uh, so the thing that you can see on the screen is actually Zonfir's website right now. <clears throat> I designed it. Um, so if you think about learning, you need to think about where do we actually learn things. Most of our learning is non-institutional. Most of our learning happens on the street with other people, you know, in conferences like this, in settings like this, um, you know, sharing experiences. So if you look at our education, it's mostly self-education. Um, most of these um, schools that we attend today don't really provide us with, um, with the knowledge that we use every day. Uh, Isaac Simo said self-education is the only education I believe there is. Um, so if you take that notion of self-education, you do have to think um, in this time, how can we redesign um, education, educational systems to actually um, be in line with this, uh, with this type of learning. We're now in this age of uh, digital transformation. Everybody are talking about digital transformation. Sadly, a lot of governments are talking about digital transformation. And, you know, oftentimes we see that in e-services, but sadly we also see that in, in schools, in educational systems. Um, governments think that digitizing education is something that we... Um, inherently have to do, you know, taking this offline education, adding a few computers, adding some kind of software, and, you know, we have you know, digitally transformed education. But in non-scare societies, you know, we, we do have commons. Um, most of us know about free software, and, and we can see that a lot of common uh, resources are shared, um, you know, without compensation. And that's something that we, we do with, with knowledge, too. Um, that's something that we often do with, with knowledge, and we do it in a digital uh, ecosystem right now. So if you look at the current educational system, you know, the, the first question we have, to, we have to ask is, is this the best thing that we can do right now? With all the technological advancements that we have, education right now seems to be lagging behind um, in terms of software, in terms of methodology, in terms of pedagogy. Um, so what's wrong with school now? Uh, we, we have a social dynamic that's wrong um, on, a, on a more profound level, if you look at education, we're basically isolating people inside uh, and you know, trying to teach them about the world outside, we're actually isolating them in buildings. Um, we're basically providing isolation as a service, especially if you look at children, young children. Um, isolating children in schools is something that you do as a favor to, to parents, right? Um, but oftentimes, uh, current educational systems discourage learning for you know, for, for the sole purpose of, of learning something, and it discourages lifelong learning. Um, you have eight grades of elementary school, four grades, four years of high school, four to five years of college, and that's basically it. You, you, have, you can stop learning now. <laughs> you know everything, right? Um, so these things are something that is 
very deeply implemented in our current educational system, you do have limitations to how long you can stay in an institution and learn. Uh, also, we do um, have this academy first view of the world, right? Um, so the academy first view of the world is that you're basically learning so you can progress to the next level of aca academic learning, right? You go to high school, you get good grades, mostly so you can go to college, and then get good grades so you can go to a master's degree program, and then, you know, finally you kind of get to a doc or something like that, and then you can express yourself, and then you're 35 or 40, and <laughs> it's a bit harder. Um, on another problem that we have in the current educational system, which is also very visible now in the colleges, but in high schools and elementary schools, is the cult of the average. You have to take a classroom, see you know, who you're working with, and then you know, make up an average that you can you know, teach to, because you can't really personalize learning right now. Um, so if you look at the traits of, of school 1.0, um, it's offline first, um, knowledge is very fragmented. When I say knowledge is fragmented, I mean if you have some piece of information that could be valuable, that's knowledge to someone, um, you oftentimes have teachers just, you know, telling that to their students, and then another teacher in another school is doing the same work for the same type of information, and that just, you know, it's repeated a lot of times. Uh, a lot of times we use proprietary software, especially here in Serbia, you, you, you can see that. Uh, there is no common shared resource, so there is no network, there is no infrastructure for teachers to actually share data, share information, share knowledge through. Um, it's mostly, you know, self-organized if, if it exists at all. It's not agile, and we can see that now in the digital transformation era, is that every time we try to implement some kind of um, tech uh, curriculum, we end up, you know, lagging behind five years, because, you know, it takes a lot of time to change curricula, it takes, takes a lot of time to implement that in a system, educate teachers, a lot of these things happen very structured, in a structured manner, but it takes a lot of time. Um, we don't really leverage technology for evaluation. Evaluation is still, I don't know, um, how many of you are from Serbia? Yeah, so you know there's a one to five grade system or there's a uh, you know, F to A, uh, but we still use that kind of a, kind of a system. Uh, when I spoke to teachers, I asked them, so okay, what's a five? And they say, it depends. So you have a quantitative system for measuring knowledge, but it depends. It depends from person to person, from teacher to teacher, from school to school. So, you know, you end up with, you know, five numbers that don't really, they're not really portable. You can't really work with them. Um, and we don't personalize. We don't adapt this knowledge to, to every student, which is something that technology can, can help us do. Um, but more about that later on. So with the advent of internet, we started thinking about, okay, uh, let's build online education. I mean, we have the internet, right? So this is, this is a, an unlimited infrastructure we can use. Uh, so the first core problem that we started with is that we wanted to take the offline education that we know and you know, we grew, grew, grew up in that system. We want to take that and just put it on the internet. So in the 90s, people would sell books online and you, know, you could order a book and you get a printed copy. And then we started you know, introducing PDFs and introducing digital documents. And then in 2000s, there was this movement called Open Educational Resources, or OERs, um, which basically said, okay, we have a lot of knowledge, but we don't have a legal framework to actually share them between universities. Let's build something. So they did. They built a legal framework where you as a student or a researcher or an academic can take your knowledge, license it openly, and share it with other people in the institutions. That also includes open access textbooks, so students in, in Western Europe countries can actually you know, take textbooks for, for colleges and just you know, get them as an open source content, open content. Um, in 2010s, which is something that probably everyone remembers, is the MOOC era. Um, how many of you have ever start, started working on Coursera, edX, MIT, OpenCourseWare? <laughs> I, think, I think a lot, yeah. Uh, I, myself too. So we had, this, we had this movement of like, let's educate the masses, right? It's a very popular movement. 
Uh, Coursera had 58 million people joining in uh, on courses. And it just crashed. No one knew why. Some people knew why, but you know, they really couldn't explain it. So the MOOCs are not really popular today, right? And you can see that as a problem of infrastructure and a problem of uh, dynamics that this kind of online education provides. In essence, online education is not online natively. It's offline education that's trying to you know, present itself as online education. Um, okay, so back to the OERs. Uh, what's, the, what's the problem with OERs? OERs exist. Um, colleges use it, universities use it, especially in Europe and, and um, North America. A lot of universities use OERs. The problem is it's mostly uh, academia. It's mostly people from universities, mostly researchers. And not a lot of students know about this thing because it's a legal framework. You as a student go in and you know, that's not something, that, that's not the first thing you learn about your textbooks is that this is legally an open content. You can use it, you can share it. Um, not a lot of students actually think about it. Quality issues uh, started popping up as OERs uh, started you know, being widespread. Um, it's in moderation and in, you know, Interaction between stakeholders, a lot of universities found it very hard to actually get someone to evaluate a textbook. Um, just do a simple moderation work, uh, review, whatever. Um, that's mostly due to lack of uh, discoverability and lack of funding. Um, and also we had started you know, seeing that OERs are not really sustainable because they live in this very closed ecosystem of you know, higher academia, so you have people who are, you know, post-grads, uh, researchers in institutes. Um, so OERs are, are very hard to implement because governments and legislators don't really know about OERs enough and don't really care enough. Uh, especially in countries like Serbia where you have, you know, different, um, I, I would say, factories that produce um, and mass produce uh, textbooks. So MOOCs. MOOCs were supposed to be like, the thing that just changes the whole humanity, right? Everybody can just go, learn something, they get a degree, but that's not important because it's online and it's free. So the problem with MOOCs is that you have a bad social dynamic. The only good thing about schools for kids now is that they can see other people, you know? They can share experiences, they can make friends, um, they build their own networks, right? Um, in MOOCs, you're basically taking the whole offline education, separating the good part, taking the bad part and putting it on the internet, and you're like, yeah, I can click now. It's like, that, that, that was not the point. Uh, and that's something that they didn't realize immediately because suddenly you had 58 million people, people on, on one platform. It's like, this is probably good. <laughs> but then after they started commercializing, uh, they've seen a sudden drop to 54,000 people who are actually paying for courses. So that led to another conclusion is that the business model behind the whole thing is that you don't have a business model. You just started building something, got a lot of capital, and you were like, uh-huh, okay, what, what now? What, what we do now? Um, it wasn't sustainable. Again, human interaction be between stakeholders was very, very bad. If you're in Serbia or you know, you're in India and you have to communicate with someone in the US who's a lecturer, it's very hard there's a language barrier, there's, you know, usually connectivity issues, cultural uh, issues, you know, different cultures, different communications. A lot of these things that were not taken, that, that were taken for granted and not really seriously, is that we have inherent cultural differences. It doesn't make sense to build one global thing. Um, technology availability was also an issue. You had a lot of people from India coming to MOOCs, but not a lot of people from Africa, um, because not a lot of people in Africa have you know, good high bandwidth internet, and oftentimes they don't have electricity throughout the whole day, which is another problem. You know, you're building this for the uneducated part of the world, quote marks, but you're actually building it on technologies available, you know, in the valley or, you know, in the urban US, right? So you had this disparity of how, how often do you have people who are connected properly in Africa as they are in New York, right? And then retention. 
when someone goes into a website and says, you can join for free. And you're like, I can join for free. You don't need a credit card. Okay, just one click. And then you're like, oh, that was easy. I have other things to do. The problem is you, you couldn't really keep people on the platform because the first time they run into a bump or they don't know what to do, they have questions, you don't have a person next to you to ask, you don't know how to ask, you know, you, you have to participate, you have to be actively participating, participating in those communities online, which, prove, which has proven not to be very, very um, user friendly. So the conclusion of this, let's build online education is that it was not really brave. Uh, between 1999 and today, so in the last 20 years, the audience has changed dramatically. Um, you know, kids today have mobile phones, they're digital natives, um, you know, the goals have changed. We are transitioning, most of the world is transitioning now to a, you know, a capital uh, market economy. Um, some other parts of the world, you know, are, are stagnating. There's, there's, it's not a unipolar world anymore. Uh, the society has changed. Um, technology has changed. Look at the internet in the 1999 and look at the internet today. Look at the bandwidth, look at the technology that we have. Look at the mobile phones. Just Mobile phones are a great representative of the difference that we have in the last 20 years. So what's the goal of building an actual school 2.0? It has to be a revolution, but it doesn't have to be a violent one. It needs to be a modest revolution because we already have the technology needed to build a new school, a new educational system. Uh, we just need a consensus on pedagogy and on the model and on a, a lot of these things are truly human and emotional and not technological. Because if you look at technology, a PDF is also a book, but it's not a book, but it's not really a digital document. You can't really do a lot of things. While if you do you know, HTML, you can do a lot of things with that document. Um, that's the same thing that we have with, with um, changing education now. Uh, we already have the technology. We don't have the consensus on how to do that, um, how to change education. So the first uh, principle of Education 2.0 is that it has to be free by default. When I say free, I don't mean free as in gratis. I, I mean free as in freedom, um, because not a lot of things um, outside digital space are free uh, in money. So we do have to take that into account. But it doesn't mean building a market around education. And that's something that we can see in a, our society today. One of the worst traits of our society today is that we've built a market economy around education and, and um, healthcare. So why is this a problem? You know, you have huge publishers that are taking immense amounts of money trying to build an economy around education. You know, we've seen that with people who actually fought this. You know, you, you have a good example is Aaron Schwartz, who sadly is not amongst us anymore. But we, we see that on, on his example is that people who tried to liberate knowledge were prosecuted severely and, you know, uh, shunned out of society for, for trying to provide free knowledge to everyone. Um, we do, you, if you look at free software, we see that every resource that takes um, zero amount of um, cost to produce is something that we can convert to a common. So a lot of people who are willing to donate their time don't have expenses toward you know, building uh, free software. It's, it's not very easy, as we can see. Free software is, is sadly not sustainable enough. But we can see that, that if the amount, of the cost for production is negligible. We can just um, share that as a common, and that's something that we need to strive toward. Uh, for a post-scarcity society, um, converting our economy to a commons, peer-based production is something that we can do uh, if you know we can get the cost of production to be zero or near zero. Um, I think that one of the biggest principles in education right now should be denouncing competition and. MOOCs are, were the opposite of that. MOOCs were, we're a university, and you're a university, and we're just going to compete on the same platform, which is insane. You have Harvard and Stanford, who had their own lecturers, who built courses. They invested a lot of time. They invested a lot of money in that. And then you basically had two courses on the same topic from different universities who were competing each other. 
while you know in the same time they could produce some one force that was you know um, a sum of uh, the best that they can do. Um, one more thing is, is really important, and that's, that's something that I mentioned previously. Technology is not the problem. We don't have a problem with technology. We have the tools to build this. We have a lack of consensus amongst humans. Um, so most of our modern education, digital education, as presented by governments and, and different uh, for-profit entities, is that we need to learn so we can be valuable in the industry. You're, you're learning to be a, you know, a cog in someone's you know, machine. No. Before, you know, even in Eastern Europe, um, you had this value through authority. You're learning so the government can just put a stamp on your diploma and you're, you know, you, you're not authorized to be knowledgeable. Um, but never in this evolution of education have we had a movement that said, let's just learn for the sole, sole purpose of being better human beings. And this is the problem that we have today. Um, so education 2.0, education in general, should be a public resource. This is something that we, need to, that we need to share with other people. And liberty knowledge has proven to be very difficult, but if we start building corpuses that are free from beginning, we can actually, uh, we can actually achieve that public resource because we started building it uh, free by default. Right? So what should the school 2.0 be? Some basic principles is that it should be free as in freedom, and it shouldn't be really free as in beer. right? Um, if we have logistics or infrastructure costs, that's something that we, we can cover. There is no need to build a market around education. This is something that one of the plagues of today's society is building a market economy around education. Um, you know, we, can, we can share the costs. You know, this, could, this could be a peer-based production uh, of knowledge. Uh, another thing is that it should be crowdsourced, meaning you know, denouncing competition, being singular, and being peer-reviewed uh, is something that's, that's very valuable, and it's proven to be very good for projects like Wikipedia. A lot of people say, no, this can't be done. It's like, look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia has done it. Um, look at MOOCs. <laughs> MOOCs have done it in a, in a sense. Sadly, they haven't open sourced their, their courses yet, but hopefully when they finally die out, we can see a lot of that material open. Um, it should be personal and adaptive. Uh, you can hear a lot of things today, a lot of good things about artificial intelligence, so to say, you know, glorified statistics, applied statistics. Um, a lot of the technology that we have right now can help us adapt uh, to particular students, which is something that we're basically not leveraging at all. And it should be meritocratic, meaning if you can actually, like Wikipedia, if you can actually provide us with value and you provide others with value and you get value in, in return, that's a good system, right? But most importantly, it should be biomimetic. Uh, and that's something that I started um, the talk with. You should have processes that you, know, you observe in nature. If people are learning in a particular way, don't build a school that says, no, this way that you're being, it's been very successful, you've been doing that for a long time, but we're gonna build something that's not that, because we can. Schools should be biomimetic because people have a good mechanism for learning. We just need to cultivate it. We don't need to go against it, right? And another thing is, you know, being free of curricula and agenda. Uh, that's something very hard to, <laughs> to pitch to governments. Governments, you know, really like that, you know, having a curriculum because you have this job market and you need to f fill up. Um, but, you know, curricula is, are, in essence, oppression against knowledge. You know, people, people generally don't think about that. But if you look at that, um, if you have a curricula, you're limited in sense of what you are allowed to learn and what's really evaluated uh, in schools. And it should be obviously be universal, meaning you know, being adaptive to language and cultural differences. Localization is a big part of that. Again, Wikipedia is a good example of how that's done. Uh, kind of OK. So the ideal implementation is that you know, we have all these principles in a school, right, uh, which is openly and transparently governed. Um, it has an open and common infrastructure, and the schools are, are built as platforms. If you look at software, it's easy to, uh, easy, easy to, uh, to uh, understand. It's how do you build a platform? You, you build an API. You build something that you can build on top of, right? Uh, it's a platform. You build on top of that. Um, and it's insane how, how schools are not structured like that today. If you have a job market, why wouldn't the job market be able to tap into a school? Why wouldn't the school have an API? Why wouldn't people in schools have APIs? 
Um, and we still don't think about that enough. And uh, again, leaving the space for, for profit and competition is important in a, in a you know, market economy because you know, you, you people <laughs> depend on, on money. Um, but it needs to be on top of that platform, not the base of the platform itself. Um, why profit is so problematic in education is that if you look at for-profit universities, especially in North America, you're going to see that if an organization is basically charging you for education, their, their job is not to educate you, it's to, to take your money. So the whole um, system of principles changes from their side. You know, they're here to charge you for something, and that's their first goal. Um, one of the most important things in this um, stakeholder communication and consensus is that we should have open pedagogy. If you're a good teacher, you should be able, as a part of the system, to teach other people how to do the same thing that you're doing. How, you, how do you present knowledge? How are you a um, co-creator, a mentor to people? Um, and this is something that's in very early stages right now, but that's something that we need to have a consensus on, especially in the academia right now. So what are the challenges of implementing this? Um, establishing and governing bodies probably going to be a lot harder than people think. Um, just getting the consensus on, on, on these things is going to take years probably. And then sustainability. Um, the, the model that I'm going to present to you later on is something that is going to probably explain the sustainability part um, in a bit de more detail. Uh, building core infrastructure is something that we as you know, free software contributors can do, building free software that you can use, reuse in other schools, exchange, adapt to cultures, adapt to needs, um, adapt to mediums, but we need to build one of that. You, know, you can build one virtual learning environment. You don't need two media wikis. You, know, you don't need two Linux kernels. Well, if you're Google, you do, but you don't need two Linux kernels. You, know, you need different drivers. And that's the same, uh, the same architecture we can apply to education. Um, of course, licensing and adoption is going to be hard, but this is more of a, on a legal side that I don't want to go into now. Uh, we, we do know how legalese can be a, a bit tricky thing to do. Um, what are the extrinsic challenges? I mentioned previously that not a lot of people have access to the internet. You know, we are the lucky ones. Um, there is still a lot of people in the world who don't have the, the access to basic things like electricity. Um, there is, a, there is a huge gap um, in access to personal computing units. If you look at mobile phones, mobile phones are not really a computing unit that you can learn on um, in the same way that you can learn on a, on a laptop, right? Um, and we, we still have a lack of that personal computing unit in a sense that we have as, as developers, as people who are you know, hacking away on something. Um, digital literacy is also a huge problem. There was a picture a few days ago uh, that in Serbia, kids in seventh grade uh, actually draw the whole Microsoft Word UI in their notebooks, which is, which is cool if you're in art class. Um, but we have a problem with digital literacy. A lot of people don't know, like Word and LibreOffice are, are you know, what's LibreOffice? Is that Word? It's like, no, it's the same thing. You, you write documents. It's like, no, I just, I just know Word, right? There's, there's no other thing. So we do have that vendor locking, and we have a lot of these things that we don't feel as people who are you know, technically savvy, but a lot of common people do. Um, OK, so the base model for this is if we have an architectural model of how this education should look, then you know we can start from the base. Um, we do need principles, and you know we, we need a governing body, and we need a standards, and that's something that you can see in organizations like W3C or IATF. A lot of these organizations have the same principle of you know building standards, having committees that focus on different things. Right? W3C is probably uh, a good example of that. Not a lot of people can you know um, say that. I want to do all of these things that are included in education. But if you have a committee on accessibility, if you have a committee on localization, you can separate that, uh, that work amongst people who are actually interested in that. So the governance part is very, very basic. You take the models that work right now in organizations like W3C. And in infrastructure, you know, you're basically building this for people. That's the part of anthropogenic um, education. 
You're building this for people, but then you're building infrastructure that these people can share, right? So we're bu building free software. For example, if we're building a virtual learning environment, we're building that free software and everybody can take it, adapt it, redistribute it, use it in their schools. Um, also, the corpuses of knowledge is something that's fundamental to this model is that we're building content corpuses that are free and open. You can add to it, you can review it, you can you know, fight other people. It's like Wikipedia, but better. Um, and then there's, of course, data. You know, every data point that we can, we can generate uh, is something that should be a part of that open infrastructure that, that you, know, you have as a common shared amongst all of these. Um, so I didn't want to have this only abstract. Um, so three years ago, I started this project. It's this basically an archetype of School 2.0, and it's called Zonfit. So, um, the goals for us were, let's limit us to one application. Let's limit us to building a free corpus of computer science knowledge, building this free school infrastructure, a learning environment, you know, the tools that you need, the communication, um, testing the requirements. Is this really possible? Is this a pipe dream? Um, and to test if this can, you know, be sustainable. Okay, can, maybe it can work today, but does it, you know, endure a year or two? And it was, it was very, um, very challenging, and it's an ongoing project right now. But we started with simple features. We started with a virtual learning environment and an offline learning environment, something that most of us are, are familiar with. And then we added a couple of things. We added identity um, platforms, and we added an API. Uh, the API was also a data platform. And we started you know, investigating how can we you know, build a proper social dynamic emulating real environments, working on real projects. Free software is also a good part of that because you know, free software is very easy to access. Students can go into free software and say, okay, I can see the code, I can in inspect, I can learn something, I can see what other people did. So they started actually contributing to free software. So now we had this school, right? Now, meaning three years after. Um, we had this school and then you have a learning environment which can be offline or, or online, you have the software for the online environment that's also you know, inheriting all that corpus and software and data, and that software is providing you an API for data or identities. And now you have a school that a company can tap into. You have a school that has an API. So you as a company, for example, a recruiting marketplace, can tap into a school, right? You can get a lot of information about people, about their skills, about their necessities in the job market. And you know, through that API, you're, you're, you have built a school that's a platform uh, that other people, uh, people can use. The identity uh, part of that is that you as a student can own your identity. And ideally, this identity part would be a part of the core infrastructure later on as you know, schools would reach a consensus of how to share um, or not share identity uh, information. Um, OpenID is a good example of how this fed can be done as a federated uh, technology, but ideally students would be able to take part in any school without the school actually owning their identities as our schools do now. Um, so what could we do with this school? What can you do with this that you can't do with a, a college or something? Um, so ideally, you know, you have a lot of data, right? Um, and you can do a lot of stuff with data, as we've seen with, uh, with a lot of nice companies that we trust our data with uh, every day. So one of the things that we could measure outcomes, and you know, by measuring outcomes, you have a lot of data of how people perform in different situations, different scenarios. And we started thinking about, can we build algo-generated paths? Can you actually find the best way to learn something by using the data that people generate? Can the platform say, this is, by far the best way, or you know, data substantiated the best way to learn something because people have performed better, many people have performed better in this path, right? So, you know, using behavioral analytics, you could improve outcomes for people, you can help them learn, you could help them not go into a wall, you know, because they don't know how to approach a certain topic. Another thing is that how could you really build that kind of um, visual learning is that you need to have something that's 
machine readable as a document, but you need people to compile their code or show their graphics on, right? We can't do that with Markdown. We can't do that with you know, HTML without a lot of add-ons. So we started developing a smart document. We took ODF and we thought about how can we make this machine readable? Uh, how can we make this um, you know, run a virtual machine as a container, as an autonomous container inside a document? So you can compile code. And a lot of this is uh, a part of our research with Jupyter. Uh, a lot of you maybe know about Jupyter, is that you can actually run code inside a notebook. It's a live notebook. So we wanted to build a smart document that you can tap into. The document that has an API, the document has uh, a virtual machine, and you can run code inside of it in an in a autonomous container. This would allow us to build a knowledge graph the documents would be able to communicate amongst each other, sharing data, and the documents themselves would be data points. We wouldn't have to have a, a, spark, a Sparkle um, database or a linked data uh, knowledge graph. We could use the documents that people generate to build a crowdsource uh, knowledge graph. A few more things that we experimented with was um, algo-generated content, which is <laughs> very cool, but you know, in very early stages, is you know, basically teaching, um, teaching uh, an engine to go to the internet and just learn about, or actually tell you about a, a different topic, just by using the internet uh, as, a, as a learning tool. It, we had some interesting responses, um, to say the least. Learning companion bots, if you have a bot that's your personal mentor, just reminding you, you can actually uh, help people uh, stay on course improving retention. Uh, you know, you have a lot of people who are using Messenger, uh, a lot of these proprietary uh, platforms like Slack, and they use it every day. Why wouldn't you leverage um, the, the community and the ecosystem that these companies have built to actually provide students with some uh, bots that can help them stay on track? Um, social augmentation engine is a, is a cool thing. With the data that we gather, we can actually find out who's the best fit for a team. Uh, with a certain parameters. And when you go to a recruiting company and then you say, we have a lot of data, and then they say, okay, um, so how is that better than a CV? Or a resume, you say, well, we can, we can know, we have a static analysis running on every code commit that people make, so you can see through time how they've progressed through they're learning, so you can see their code improvements, they can see you know, the style, how they've implemented new libraries, how they implemented new technologies, and you can see that through time. And they're like, huh, okay, that sounds fun. So you, ha yeah, you have an immense amount of power with that data, right? Also the impact analysis, if you're contributing to this, you should know how you've impacted the whole community, how you impacted other people. So we started building an analysis engine to tell you okay, you contributed yesterday, so this is a part that you know, has, has reached this amount of people, helped this amount of people to, to learn something, which is very valuable for people who are, who are contributing, right? Um, also, a consensus-dependent evaluation is something that's, that's a core thing, so avoiding authoritative evaluation, you know, a stamp on a, on a diploma is very hard, because how do you evaluate knowledge? If you look at how we evaluate knowledge in nature, you know, we have different scenarios where people can prove their knowledge through work, through presentation, you know, through different um, papers, and people build trust. So we're building a trust model around evaluation, you know, saying, I trust that you're, you know, you know what you're talking about, not just me, other people trust you. So we're building a consensus evaluation saying, okay, now I kind of think that society has agreed upon you being an expert, right? Um, and of course, you know, with the data and the digital landscape, you have new opportunity for didactics. Alexa is a good thing um, if you exclude the whole privacy concern. Um, if you build that kind of technology, you can use, hopefully, the similar thing, but free and open source, to you know, read to people. Alexa can read to people. It's very simple. It's a, it's a simple skill to learn. Um, so people can actually get these very simple, very basic uh, value, for, that, that simple value from Alexa, right? Um, then we started thinking about this. Okay, how do we adapt this to a market economy? Um, people have recruitment tools, you know, you have AngelList, you have a lot of these platforms that just take people's data 
and they recruit people or you know sell you the data for people that you can later hire. So you can build ATS tools or you can build uh, recruitment tools on top of on top of school. You can build a mentoring marketplace. So if people want to pay someone for their time to mentor them, actually, people can actually build something on top of a school and say, now I leverage your API to, to you know, offer you my time uh, and you can pay for it. Um, didacticals, of course, you know, every kind of didactical you can think about is something that you can tap into because you have a school that has an API. Uh, a lot of the things that we in software take for granted, we don't have an education. So this example is, Let's just take the things that we take for granted and just implement a school that, that leverages the technology that we have. And of course, a lot of bots, uh, every kind of bot, even the stupid ones with the GIFs or GIFs or whatever you want to call it. Um, so if you can get um, a bot that helps retention, then you, you've successfully managed to leverage Facebook's infrastructure to help people stay on track. So now finally, you have this federation model, which has an ecosystem on top of a school, which basically allows you to provide goods or services as a third party, not integrating into the school, not owning the identity of people who are at the school, right? Not owning the data, not owning the school. Meaning, governments can build services on top of the school, not owning the school. It's highly improbable that that's gonna happen soon, but it's possible. Companies can actually build on top of a school without owning the identities, without owning personal data of the students that go into schools. And they don't have to be integral to the school. They don't have to fund schools. They don't have to be the ones who are actually you know, making decisions inside the educational system. You have a platform that allows them to be in loop and to leverage educational systems, but you know, just, just stay out of the stakeholding uh, part. So what can you do to help? Um, you know, knowledge exchange is a good thing. Uh, anyone that has any ideas, critiques, um, I'm open for it. We do have a translation community. A lot of the, the content that we provide, we provide in English or Serbian, so we need a lot of people to translate, obviously. We do need help with legal expertise. Uh, we do have a great team of, of people who help us with legal issues, but of course, you know, legal being what it is, always needs help from people from other jurisdictions um, and people who know legislators. Of course, advocating to the governments and industry stakeholders is really important. Getting this rolling is not a project that happens in a year. So you know, people who can actually join in um, and help are always appreciated. If you want to join the discussion, you can go, we're at, on Matrix. So you can join us in Matrix and just, just talk about this. Uh, or you can just uh, ping me with any questions you have. And with that, I, I'm, I hope that uh, this wasn't too abstract. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. So, do you have any kind of strategy how to approach government and say, listen, uh, this will work because I have a great idea. You know? Yeah, you have a great idea, but show me how. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you look at how different um, movements have been adapted to serve uh, public interest, right? Uh, adaptation of free software into governments. GNU is 30, 40 years old now. Um, and you still don't have proper integration of you know, free software in public infrastructure. So if you think about that, it's, it's a 30 year long battle and governments still don't understand how to implement free software and free software is something that we're you know, congregating around today. Right? So I think this is going to be very hard. Uh, setting up a strategy would be you know, like a five year plan. Uh, it's, it's something that you can plan for, but you know, it, it doesn't matter. I think that free software has um, gotten to a point where you have um, a quality in quantity, right? Because free software is a singular economy. If you build one Python library, usually if you don't have a very specific reason for it, you can improve on it, and you only require that one for that sole purpose. It's very you know, improbable that you're going to build another one if this one meets your demands and you can contribute to it and there's an there's a open and transparent governance of it. And that's the same with education, right? It's a singular economy. If you build a course on something and the whole human humanity joins on building some kind of knowledge, 
you're going to get to a point where this quantity is a quality. And you know, as free software today is something that it's impossible to, to ignore, free education is also going to be that, maybe even sooner, because you know, free software is, a, is an unlimited scope of software you can build, but you know, education is one. You know, we, can, we can build on you know, one topic at a time. Right? So the answer is I don't know. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, can I hear like lots more about this document format, how it functions, <laughs> what it looks like? Uh, it, it sounds compelled, is that like you said like, like markdown but not like markdown, so something like LaTeX? And most importantly, if it's, if it's like this container and it's interacting, but it's doing with other documents, but this is really exciting, but it's also worrying that you're saying it's containerized, so it's safe, and then interacting with other documents, so it's going outside the environment into other things, and then I think, I really want this kind of thing to interact with variables on the rest of my computer, but I hope nobody sticks anything really bad in there that will then do horrible things to my computer. This, I don't know if I'm asking too much, you know, no. but... <laughs> Yeah, you just speak lots about that. Yeah, that's a perfect question. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so one, we start with Markdown, and Markdown is not a language, it's just an abstraction on, it, you, you just parse text. Um, so we've started you know, looking into what we can use as a base, and we landed on uh, ODF. Uh, so um, with the Document Foundation, you know, being very open about the, the, the whole open document format, you have an extensive um, specification how this works. It's an XML based um, format which works really well with parsing and it's good for you know data um, content portability. Um, so the idea of this document is that the autonomous container should not be uh, communicating outside the document. Um, there is an option for this to use an RPC of some kind but you know still in, in the prototype phase you have one document and you can attach one virtual machine to it, but it doesn't communicate with others, meaning you have a live notebook, but th these notebooks don't really communicate to, um, throughout the whole network, right? Just because of the threat model, uh, it's very hard to implement. So the idea of this is, can you use um, an XML-based format to build a knowledge graph, right? Um, the knowledge graph uh, is usually built in triple-based uh, databases, right? You have different languages that can query that data, but there's a huge missed opportunity in Wikipedia, for example, where people are actually contributing now even structured data. Uh, but Wikipedia is not really using it to pipe into Wikidata or other projects that can leverage structured data for any kind of purpose, right? Uh, so the idea was take an XML-based format, build, um, build a format that can contain um, different you know, types of educational content and just by providing structured data inside of the format and by providing a virtual machine, you have this live notebook that looks like Jupyter, but you also have the option of building an engine that can tap into all of these documents as a network outside of these autonomous containers, not touching upon that because if you look at the code, if you look at something, it's still the content, right? It can be both static and dynamic if you need it to be. Um, so you can tap into that static content and just use the structured data for some kind of analysis or just extracting all that data out, but still having you know, both a static and dynamic format. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a huge thing. Uh, the ODF specification is over a thousand pages long. We started building upon uh, ODF because ODF actually plans in the specification to be extended to a smart document in the future in any kind of possible way. So they kind of planned for it, like we left the space for you to build a smart document, we just didn't know how. But it's there in the specification, so that's why we chose it. It's portable, you know, it's XML, it's parsable, it's not proprietary, you know, it's, it's standardized. It's, you, know, you have LibreOffice or OpenOffice that uses it, you have Microsoft Word that uses it if, if they want. So, yeah, we can talk more about the, the actual technical implementation of the format if you want. I hope that that answered just a bit. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, what about 
about uh, student privacy? Because you said like operation point on the day, terrible point, I mean, you have your own identity and stuff. But you still also said that recruiters will be able to see all your data, everything you generate in your learning process. So is that really, I mean, the best idea? Yeah, it depends on the implementation. If you take, like, the, the first initial idea for us is if we build a, a federated I identity uh, service, right, you as a student, you as the identity owner can actually control the data you provide to every each application that requests for it. I mean, it's a bad example, but think about OAuth 2, for example. You're allowing access to a resource, right? So you as an identity provider have a container with your data, and inside that container you have your um, learning parameters, you have your personal information, and you can choose what to share with each application provider. For example, if you want to participate in a certain application, you can choose to do that. If you don't, the application would not get your data. It's, it's very simple if you look at it in a, federated, in a federated way. If we look at it in a centralized ID way, like Facebook Connect, uh, Google accounts, and things like that, then it's very hard to implement. Um, you could use OAuth for that, but it, you know, it would still require a lot of technical implementation. So with, with what we've built, you actually have an identity provider that requests access to application services, not the other way around. Uh, and application services can offer you, look, we have a, you know, a marketplace for jobs. Do you want to get hired? And you're like, yeah. And you send them the data that you choose to, to send. Um, it's something that Facebook wanted to do but never really implemented properly. But you, you know they have look what you're sharing thing. Um, it's, it's very similar to OAuth. So I think that that provides a good separation uh, and it kind of alleviates that concern of like privacy issues. Uh, ideally, that identity would be something that's separate from school. Um, right now we don't have that, but hopefully we would be able to, to separate the identity service outside of a school, a singular school, and allow one identity service to be used throughout the schools everywhere, right? Um, because you would be then able to control your data outside a specific school and not having a problem of do you trust your school with your data? I mean, it's very similar to do you trust Facebook with your data, right? So, second question, uh, if you have a corporation that can directly influence the learning outcomes, we already have some issues with that, that when corporations start to involve themselves in education, you start to have very specialized people when they start to come influence on that, which they then tend to throw out like in 10 to 15 years and just pick up new people who will learn the new stuff that they need now. So, I mean, of course, that's a problem that should solve itself if you know you have enough free knowledge and people yeah. you know what they need. But in the way of current capitalistic world, it's kind of hard to not just you know jump into the minimum knowledge you need for the job you want. So that's also maybe um, a problem if you're left with the precious through your uh, education. So. Um the way I approach that right now is that throughout the Beyond It program that we, we now run, uh, it's an offline program in a, in a small town, you know, very difficult to run. Um, you can see how people's motivations differ from person to person, right? Uh, and then another thing is I wouldn't separate the world to capitalist or communist or, I mean, I mean there's, you know, there are capitalist countries that are more socialist than China is. Uh, I, I want to separate this to are we running toward a market-based economy? Are we running toward you know, planned production economy, which no one is going toward right now? Or the third option is, do we want a peer-based, commons-based economy, right? Um, free software is a good example of commons, peer-based production, right? A commons-based market. Um, you provide value because it's you know, insignificant to you to provide it, right? Uh, and then in that landscape of like, I have free knowledge and I can do what I want because I'm, as a human, the center of education. If my motivation is to get hired in Google, I'm going to strive toward that, right? And the problem is not going to say, you have to do one of these things. But if I'm a hacker who just wants to take, you know, rust and hack away on something that's going to be open source and I don't want money for it, I don't want my school or other people's schools to actually you know, prevent people from doing that. So 
in essence, that's the point of anthropogenic um, education, is that you as a person can decide what you want to do, and the corporation does not have the power to actually limit the school to one uh, way for you or the other. So I think that by providing free knowledge, you would be able to you know, just do whatever you want, depending on what the thing is. If you want to get hired, if you want to participate in a market economy, and you want to go work for Google or other company, you can do that. If not, you can do another thing. It, the school is not opinionated in any way. Any questions? Well, thank you very much again.